Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Gordon, Vice President of Tax Policy at the Urban Institute and Co-Director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Future of Business Taxes Post-Inflation Reduction Act. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterwards. Speaker biographies are also available online. You can hide captions or adjust settings in Zoom with the live transcript button. All participants are muted, but please type questions or comments in the Q&A box at any time. Please take a few minutes after the event to complete a survey, and please feel free to engage with us online using hashtag live at urban. And now a few words about our topic. At the height of summer doldrums, and after many false starts, Congress proved it still has a few tricks up its sleeve. It passed and President Biden signed into law a major tax and climate bill. Among other provisions, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 makes the largest US investment ever, $370 billion in addressing global climate change. And it does so largely through tax incentives for companies and individuals to adopt low carbon emission technologies and to use less energy. It extends the American Rescue Plan's expanded subsidies for low and moderate income families to purchase health insurance through the end of 2025. It, for the first time, allows the federal government to negotiate prescription drug prices on behalf of seniors enrolled in Medicare. It levies a new 15% minimum tax on the profits that large companies report to shareholders, and it enacts a new 1% excise tax on stock buybacks. The bill also provides an $80 billion boost to the Internal Revenue Service budget so that it can shore up its enforcement efforts. This will be the topic of another TPC event, including three former IRS commissioners and other experts on November 14th. Uh, but the IRA also leaves many questions unanswered. In particular, how many companies will end up paying the new corporate minimum tax? How will the tax interact with other provisions in law including the phase out of favorable capital recovery rules and the phase in of straight line depreciation for research expenses under the TCGA. How will the new green energy tax incentives get implemented? Will the new flexibility provisions that have their desired effects? What other measures may be needed to get the US all the way to targets outlined in the 2015 Paris Climate Accords? To discuss these and other issues, we have an excellent set of speakers. First up is Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at the U.S. Treasury Department, Lily Batchelder, who will deliver keynote remarks followed by a Q&A with TPC Senior Fellow Howard Leckman. After that, we'll have a panel on the IRA's business tax provisions and then one on the green energy tax credits. A few words about our keynote speaker. President Biden nominated Lily Batchelder to serve as Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy in March of 2021. She was confirmed by the Senate the following September and she has served in that role ever since. Prior to joining Treasury, Batchelder was a professor of law and public policy at NYU. She was also deputy director of the White House National Economic Council and majority chief tax counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance. Beyond her government service, Batchelder has worked in private practice, state government, and the nonprofit sector. She holds an A.B. in political science with honors from Stanford University and an MPP from the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as a J.D. from Yale Law School. Howard Gleckman, who will be in conversation with Lily, is a senior fellow in the Tax Policy Center, where he edits our award-winning blog, Tax Box, and our daily news summary, The Daily Deduction. Gleckman has written widely on tax policy and long-term care issues, including the book, Caring for Our Parents. Before joining us, he was a journalist at Business Week and a fellow in other public policy research organizations. Thank you very much for being here, Lily. We look forward to your remarks. Um, thank you, Tracy, for the kind introduction and good afternoon to everyone from DC. It is great to be here with you all. Um, I want to first thank the Tax Policy Center for inviting me to speak. It's always a privilege to engage with my colleagues in the tax world, and I'm especially glad to be in conversation with Howard and looking forward to the investment, the expert panels. Um, I'd like to speak today about how the Inflation Reduction Act is helping address two of the most important issues of our time, climate change and inequality. For decades, there's been an established scientific consensus around the threat posed by climate change. Today, the social and economic costs are undeniable. In 2021, the US experienced 20 separate weather-related disasters that cost over a billion dollars, the second highest ever number behind only 2020 
and the total cost of these events was over $150 billion. The effects of climate change are also highly inequitable, often falling hardest on those who don't have the resources to manage them. So addressing climate change is central to creating a more equitable and just society. As President Biden has said, the 2020s are the decisive decade to address climate change. To avoid the most severe impacts, the scientific consensus is that we need sharp emissions reductions by 2030. And that's why within months of taking office, the president announced a new 2030 target for the United States to achieve a 50 to 52% reduction from 2005 levels in greenhouse gas pollution. In August, and not a moment too soon, the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law, which is the most ambitious step our country has ever taken to confront the threat of climate change. Multiple independent estimates indicate that the IRA gives us a credible path to reach the president's 2030 target. And tax is at the center of these efforts. Nearly three quarters of the IRA's projected $369 billion investment in addressing climate change is delivered through tax incentives. Prior to the IRA, existing policies and market forces were driving meaningful emissions reductions, but we had to move more um, decisively and quickly. And given the scale of investment required, federal investment alone was not going to be sufficient. We needed to strengthen policy incentives to catalyze even more overall investment. And the IRA makes a number of important changes to clean energy tax incentives to do just that. First, as Tracy alluded to, it provides long-term clarity and certainty that businesses have been seeking for years. We now have long-term extensions of the production tax credit and investment tax credit, which will unlock major new investments in large-scale clean power generation. We also now have a comprehensive set of incentives for clean vehicles covering new used and commercial vehicles that will be available through the coming decade. And these incentives, along with investments in charging infrastructure in the bipartisan infrastructure law, are already spurring billions in investment by automakers and suppliers. Second, the Inflation Reduction Act introduces new incentives to help scale emerging technologies that will be necessary to reduce emissions from hard to abate sectors. For example, clean hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuel have an important role to play in our overall move to net zero emissions but these solutions are not yet cost competitive with existing carbon intensive alternatives. With the policy support in the IRA, businesses will now be able to scale and deploy these solutions far more quickly. Third, the Inflation Reduction Act establishes new mechanisms for businesses and other entities to monetize incentives. This includes a transfer mechanism that will allow businesses with little or no federal tax liability to sell credits to another entity to make use of the credit. And it also includes a direct pay mechanism that allows state, local, and tribal governments, along with tax exempts, to receive certain credits as payments. Businesses can also receive direct pay for a limited subset of credits. And overall, these new monetization tools will be a force multiplier for greater investment by reducing the cost of financing, and in the process will accelerate decarbonization across a range of areas. The IRA does an enormous amount to address climate change, but climate policy cannot and should not exist in a vacuum. Addressing climate change will transform broad swaths of the economy and to ma manage that transition, it must go hand in hand with other policy initiatives. For example, many of the most significant climate provisions in the IRA fall under the subtitle on energy security. By taking steps to reduce emissions, we're also reducing our dependency on volatile fossil energy sources. This will help insulate our economy from har harmful energy price shocks like the one that we've had seen this year. The Inflation Reduction Act also puts a strong emphasis on US economic security by creating incentives to strengthen supply chains for key inputs. The pandemic laid bare the vulnerabilities of our existing critical supply chains. And as we build towards a clean energy economy, the IRA ensures that we address these vulnerabilities and will be able to reliably source vital materials and components, uh, principally by incentivizing sourcing from within the US and from our allies and partners. It strengthens our supply chain through direct incentives, most notably the Advanced Manufacturing Production Tax Credit, 
and also by including content-based requirements or bonuses with the credits for a range of activities. For example, the content requirements associated with the credit for new vehicles, uh, new clean vehicles, have received a lot of attention recently. And while some of these sourcing requirements may be hard to meet initially, they will ultimately ensure that our move to a zero carbon transportation sector in the coming years is supported by a strong vehicle supply chain. Another important policy objective embedded in the Inflation Reduction Act is equity and economic opportunity. As I mentioned at the outset, the impacts of climate change are highly unequal, with the cost of extreme weather often falling on those with the least resources to cope. At the same time, we know there are communities that have borne the brunt of legacy pollution, while also depending on the energy sector for a large share of their local economic activity. So as we build a clean energy economy, we need to make sure these communities are not overlooked or left behind. To do so, the Inflation Reduction Act includes targeted place-based incentives to invest in low-income communities and in historic energy communities. It also includes prevailing wage and apprenticeship provisions that will support the creation of good paying jobs and expand economic opportunity for workers. <clears throat> Given the growing income inequality and sluggish wage gains for low and middle income households, it's imperative that workers see the benefits of the clean energy economy that they're building. We're working as fast as we can to develop guidance on these prevailing wage and apprenticeship provisions in close partnership with our colleagues at the Department of Labor, and we're drawing on their deep expertise to make sure that we get it right. While the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act is historic, and it reflects the work of so many, including many of you joining us today, our work to implement the legislation is really just beginning. Treasury has experience with clean energy incentives, but the IRA requires a huge amount of innovative work in a very short period of time. The act was signed into law on August 16th, and many of the most significant and complex provisions apply after December 31st of this year. This four and a half months of lead time has few, if any, precedents in recent memory and especially considering the novelty of many of the provisions in, in the legislation, which involve important non-tax equities and expertise. At Treasury, we feel enormous responsibility to our country, our planet, and future generations to ensure that this legislation lives up to its promise. And that's why we're working as quickly as possible with our partners across the federal government and seeking broad stakeholder input in order to get implementation right. I have talked a lot about climate, um, but before I conclude, I should discuss that the Inflation Reduction Act is not just a climate bill. And I wanna mention other, two other major parts of the legislation, long-term IRS funding and corporate tax reforms. So let's start with the IRS, which is one of our government's most foundational institutions. For decades, the IRS has been underfunded and overworked. In real terms, the agency's budget declined by 18% between, between 2010 and 2021. The American people deserve better. And in recent remarks at the IRS, Secretary Yellen walked through some of the specific near-term steps forward that we're taking. First, the IRS taxpayer assistance centers have been massively understaffed and under-resourced, and this is soon going to change. By next year, every single center will be fully staffed, and as a result, we will triple the number of Americans served at these centers. Second, due to chronic understaffing and high call volume, the IRS has been unable to provide the level of phone service the taxpayers clearly deserve. During the most recent filing season, the IRS averaged a 10 to 15% level of service. In this coming filing season, we're committing the IRS to an 85% level of service. Third, the IRS will move into the digital age. In this coming filing season, the IRS will automate the scanning, scanning of millions of individual paper returns. And for taxpayers, this means faster processing and faster refunds. These are only a few near-term steps, but the IRS provides the funding to transform the IRS into a 21st century agency. And there will be many more to come in the months and years ahead. In short, thanks to the 80 billion, in long-term IRS funding in the Inflation Reduction Act. Taxpayers will eventually be able to expect more answered calls, 
greater ability to solve problems online, refunds arriving more quickly, simplified tax filings, and more. This long-term funding will also make the tax system more fair. It will enable the IRS to collect unpaid taxes, interest, and penalties from high earners who have not paid their full tax bill. For years, the IRS has lacked the resources to effect effectively audit high net worth individuals and corporations, which owe a disproportionate amount of unpaid taxes. In 2019, the top 1% of Americans were estimated to owe over a fifth of unpaid taxes. Most Americans earn their income from salary and wages, and nearly all taxes due on salary and wages are paid, in large part because of comprehensive information reporting on those sources of income. On the other hand, less than half of the taxes due are paid on complex sources of income for which there is little or no information reporting. And these opaque sources are disproportionately received by the wealthy. The strengthened IRS funding will enable it to address this unfairness. At the same time, Secretary Yellen has directed that the funding not be used to raise audit rates for households making under 400,000 per year relative to historic levels. In fact, we expect that audit rates will decline for honest, honest taxpayers once the IRS has the right technological infrastructure in place. In addition to rectifying the fundamental unfairness of the IRS being able, unable to audit effectively high income taxpayers and corporations, the additional funding will raise revenues that will help pay for the climate and other investments in this legislation. And the IRA also includes corporate tax reforms that will enhance fairness and raise revenues. One which I know is the subject of one of today's panels is the corporate alternative minimum tax. In recent years, many of the largest and most profitable corporations in our country have paid no federal income tax while reporting substantial financial statement income. While financial statement income and taxable income are different measurements used for different purposes, they are both approximations of economic income. And historically, corporations have had an incentive to reduce or eliminate taxable income while maximizing their financial statement income. This has damaging effects on the accuracy of both systems and leads to the paradoxical result that many highly profitable corporations can report losses to the IRS. The corporate alternative minimum tax will change this by imposing a 15% minimum tax on the financial statement income of corporations with three-year average financial statement income of over $1 billion. The legislation also includes a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks by public corporations. This new tax will reduce the relative tax advantage of stock buybacks over dividends and lead to a more balanced tax treatment of distributions. Not only will this lead to more efficient decisions about distributions, it will also increase U.S. tax receipts from foreign investors because they do not pay U.S. capital gains tax when they sell the stock, but they are taxed on dividends they receive. By ensuring that large profitable corporations and high income individuals pay their fair share, we're making our tax system and our economy work better for the average American. So to sum up, the IRA has brought tax policy to the forefront of our national conversation. Um, for many stakeholders, and particularly those interested in the climate provisions, this is their first time engaging in the tax regulatory process. And we're committed to providing as much information as possible about our process, so stakeholders know what to expect and how to make their voices heard. Um, but I wanna conclude with an ask for all of you, um, because I know this is a tax, um, primarily a tax audience. As the implementation process moves forward, please serve as ambassadors for the tax policy community and help us translate between the tax policy world and other policy areas that this legislation touches. Help us explain how the tax rulemaking process works and how to engage as it begins in earnest. Our success will depend on our ability to channel the insights of many fields into better tax policy. And with all the brain power gathered here today, I know that we can make our tax system fairer and our country greener. Um, so thank you. And I look forward to talking to you, Howard. Lily, thanks very much. It's always good to hear from you and good to see you. Um, let me ask a few questions uh, uh, broadly about the, about the law and uh, maybe about some specifics as well. Uh, let, let's, let's start with a broad question. So since the, uh, the IRA was signed into law in August, we've seen a lot of uh, change in the economy. 
We've seen aggressive Fed tightening, slowing in some sectors of the economy, especially housing, yet the labor market is still strong and inflation is high. So how do you think the new law is going to affect the U.S. economy going forward? There are so many positive dimensions to the likely effects of the legislation. Um, the green credits will spur job creation. They're going to lower families' bills. Um, the prescription drug provisions also will lower bills. Um, they will catalyze additional investment to address the threat of climate change. And as I mentioned, there are multiple independent estimates um, indicating that it'll give us a credible path to reach the president's 2030 target on climate change and reducing greenhouse gas pollution. Um, but it will also support many good paying jobs. Um, the estimates are that it'll support over a million high quality jobs with strong labor protections. Um, it will lower electricity bills. Um, it will lower the cost of things like electric vehicles and energy home, home improvement projects. Um, it will provide far more economic uh, certainty, long-term certainty for businesses and investors who want to transform the energy system. And for our nation's security, it's going to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels um, controlled by foreign autocrats. And uh, lastly, it will make our tax system fairer and fund significant deficit reduction. So I think all of these are really positive benefits that we can expect for the economy coming out of the bill. Well, you mentioned in your talk, uh, the regulatory process that's gonna be required to follow up on a lot of the gaps in the, in the statute. Any idea when we can expect to see some guidance on the book minimum tax? So we are working night and day on issuing guidance on all of the provisions in the bill, of which um, everyone is aware there are quite a number. Um, our work in implementing the law is gonna be guided by three core principles. One is robust public engagement. Um, so on the book minimum tax, in addition to all of the green credits and all the other provisions, we've been engaged in a very, with a broad spectrum of taxpayers and stakeholders to inform our guidance. And that process is well underway. Um, the second principle is clarity and certainty. We're working as quickly as possible to provide clarity and certainty to taxpayers so that the benefits of the legislation can be realized as quickly as possible. And then the last one is sound stewardship. Um, we're working closely with the IRS to put in place effective guardrails and reporting. Um, this is maybe less in terms of the corporate alternative minimum tax, but in terms of the green credits to ensure that the benefits are delivered as intended and making sure that eligible taxpayers are getting the credits that they are eligible for while um, carefully protecting against fraud. Um, I will say on the first principle of robust public engagement, we've issued multiple notices requesting public comment um, and we'll be issuing more and we have been having uh, many, many stakeholder meetings. Um, these notices provide an early opportunity for stakeholders to submit information that can inform our work. And then um, there will of course be further opportunities for stakeholders to weigh in, for example, in the formal notice and comment period that follows whenever we issue proposed regulations. Um, but in terms of timelines, we are just literally working night and day and through weekends um, to develop guidance on all of these provisions. Speaking of the book tax, as, as you well know, this was tried in the 1980s and it, it failed. So how do you think a book minimum tax will succeed this time when it did not succeed back in the 80s? Uh, you know, the 80s was, uh, I hate to say, because I was alive then a very long time ago. <laughs> um, so I was not a tax person back in the 80s. Um, I'm not familiar with the details, but the world has changed greatly since then. Um, I can't explain a bit about how um, the corporate alternative minimum tax will work. So it basically applies to corporations with average book income over three years of more than a billion dollars, which is determined on a group-wide basis. So it's very, very large corporations. And it implies it applies a minimum tax that is 15% um, of these very large corporations adjusted book income reduced by foreign tax credits. So basically, if a corporation owes more under this calculation than the regular corporate income tax, they pay the difference. And then there are various statutory exclusions from book income and treasury has the authority to provide for additional exclusions. So what we're doing, and maybe this also goes to your first question, is we're first reviewing the statutory language, understanding all of the likely relevant issues. Um, there are a number of places in the statutory text where we're invited to provide rules. So 
Um, those are on our list of topics to address. And then we are having many stakeholder meetings. Um, like some of you, I'm guessing on, uh, on this Zoom, we are now studying financial accounting and tapping on the resources of federal agencies with federal accounting expertise like the SEC. Um, so we are doing everything we can to get this right and to leverage the expertise of um, people that uh, are experts in financial accounting and other fields and learning from stakeholders about um, what issues we need to be aware of as we issue guidance. So as, as you just noted, the, the tax is based on modified financial statement uh, income. And many people worry that a book tax could result in less transparent financial statements or in the politicization of the Financial Accounting Standards Board. So why are the skeptics wrong? What, so I think this sort of goes back to what I remarked on earlier. There is a um, incentive right now to maximize book earnings and um, there is, it will you know, strengthen the accuracy of both measures of income if one is informed by the other. Right now there is a um, incentive to maximize book earnings and minimize taxable income. And I think this is, you know, placing a small thumb on the scale of making sure we account for what you can learn from financial statement income and measuring tax liabilities. But won't it actually create an incentive for some large corporations to reduce their financial uh, uh, statement income and therefore be less transparent to shareholders? Um, there's a, a, a literature out that that suggests that is unlikely to happen. Um, but I think the key here is that we are, um, you know, financial statement uh, reporting is a separate institution. And what we are doing here is taking into account um, the fact that some corporations are reporting extremely large book profits and not paying tax and using that as a piece of information to adjust their tax liabilities to make sure um, that those that are highly profitable are paying some tax. We know we have to get you off in a couple of minutes. So let me just ask you one question about the green energy provisions. So they try to do two things at once. They create incentives for domestic production and employment, uh, and they try to maximize the transition away from fossil fuels. But won't the Buy America provisions dilute the incentives to produce and consume green energy? For example, few if any electric vehicles currently meet the laws by America standards. So I think there are multiple goals um, that the legislation is working towards. And um, as I discussed, it is um, placing us on a very credible path to reach the president's targets on climate change. It also has important um, incentives for our future economic security to onshore supply chains and of critical minerals and other critical components, which is also um, to the benefit of our economic future. Uh, so there are multiple goals that it is serving, and I, I think on the climate front, there are multiple independent estimates that it is going to have a profound impact. Lily, I know you have to go. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, and uh, let me turn it over now to Eric Toder, who will introduce the next panel. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Howard. Um, this panel will be about the uh, business tax provisions in the in the act. Um, most of the revenue um, raised to uh, fund the new uh, ener um, environmental benefits and, and uh, transition to clean energy that Lily talked about came from basically uh, two provisions, uh, a new alternative minimum tax on corporate stock income and an excise tax on stock repurchase by corporations. In this session, we'll discuss the effects of these provisions, uh, but also uh, try to touch on uh, what the panelists think uh, should be desirable directions generally in corporate and business taxation. So um, I'm happy to have two outstanding panelists. Kim Clausing is the Eric M. Zolt Chair in Tax Law and Policy at UCLA, and she recently served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for tax analysis in the US Treasury Department. Don Schneider is deputy head of tax US policy at Piper Sandler. Before joining Piper Sandler, he was chief economist of the House Ways and Means Committee. So we have two uh, very outstanding panelists. I'm just gonna jump in 
and ask them about the corporate book minimum tax. I've had a little trouble understanding it. It's a complicated provision and it's it's meant to close preferences and make sure that companies uh, pay tax, but yet there are a lot of exceptions to book income in the bill. And so at the end of the day, I was wondering not so much about specific companies, but which industries will this tax hit and uh, how will this, uh, uh, which tax preferences are going to cause companies to be uh, tax to be triggered? So, whatever either of you can, I'll start with Kim, and she's probably more familiar with the Treasury data, and then turn it to Don, who has some experience with clients dealing with it. Yes. So, um, thanks very much, Eric. It's always a pleasure to be talking to Tax Policy Center and in one of these events, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today. The um, corporate alternative minimum tax was designed, as you pointed out, to avoid um, taking back with one hand preferences that were really important that we'd give them with another. So you could imagine, for instance, the green energy credits that Lily just described in her talk. You wouldn't want companies who had utilized those credits that, to then fall prey to the um, corporate alternative minimum tax because of those credits. So as, as you point out, there was a lot of care taken to to make sure that that didn't happen. And as a consequence, you know, the tax base itself is really falling on any more minor differences that companies might have between their book and their taxable income. So this could include things like executive comp, um, which is treated differently in book and tax reasons. And it also includes a long list of other smaller reasons that you could have these big differences. So, to some extent, it's a, it's a bit of a mysterious tax base. It's not as narrowly targeted as if you say raise the corporate tax rate or if you focused on the international provisions, which are something that I know that um, many of us in Treasury were hoping would get across the finish line, but didn't. Um, you know, So I think in, in that sense, it's definitely less well-directed, but it certainly raises you know over $200 billion. And we know which companies those are. Those are companies with over a billion dollars of financial reporting income uh, that are paying less than the effective tax rate of, of 15%. And I'm sure um, Don's been digging into the data, so I can, we can go to him too. Yeah, sure. I, and by the way, I'm just speaking for myself today, but um, I think JCT estimated roughly 50% of the taxes would fall on manufacturers. I think a large and dollar cost, a large fraction of it would be paid by financial institutions. Um, when you look at it on a company by company basis, as you know, we see in that UNC paper, um, it would fall. You know, the largest taxpayer uh, would be Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon, but um, a large fraction of the of the uh, taxes would end up being pay, be paid by, say, Ford. Or AT&T, uh, semiconductor manufacturers, uh, utilities would be especially hard hit. Um, so I don't think that necessarily speaks to the kind of industries you would think of as, um, you know, in low tax industries or, or industries who are avoiding tax for, for reasons we'd be concerned about. Um, and, and speaking of the tax base, I think that's part of the problem with uh, the way the provision uh, was designed. It's not exactly clear what fact patterns give rise to this tax in the first place. I know some adjustments were made to take um, into account differences between book and tax treatment of accelerated depreciation so that the law wouldn't penalize uh, companies who are heavy on CapEx. But nonetheless, the law still does penalize uh, those companies. You know, for example, if you are paying the minimum tax, um, you are taking your deductions in effect at 15 percent. And when, when those uh, investments yield revenue, you're taking uh, recognizing that, that income at 21 so even though the law did take care, I think, to reduce uh, burdens, um, it still nonetheless pe penalizes investment and is very unclear from a business perspective about what sort of uh, activity you take and when that actually will yield minimum tax liability. So let me just follow up a little bit um, to two ways. One, um, one of the stated purposes or one of the driving factors behind this kind of tax in, in the political discussion was all these stories of companies that are profitable that aren't aren't paying any tax. So how much will that affect that when somebody comes next year and does a report? Is that going to change a lot as a result of this bill or, or not? 
there's certainly going to be fewer companies in that category, but it's not going to be zero, right? I mean, because we do have tax incentives like research and experimentation, um, like the green energy credits, like low income housing tax credits, you know, those kinds of things that we want to preserve. So it and, and favorable investment treatment in many places in the tax code, right? So these different provisions can cause taxpayers to end up with very light tax burdens um, below 15% and still not trigger this type of tax. So I think it will be quite possible that, you know, you could write a study next year and say, well, yeah, there are profitable companies that will continue to pay very little in tax. But when that study comes out, and in general, I think when these studies come out, one should take a look and see, well, why, you know, like, is it that they're not paying tax for a reason that we think is bad or do, or is it that they're not paying tax because they're doing a ton of research or they're investing a lot in, in clean energy, you know? And so I think if you look into the details, I think you'll see, you know, that the reason that the companies are below that threshold in the future will be usually because they're doing something that, that the government is explicitly trying to encourage. Okay, and I have a follow-up question from Len Berman, who wants to know, instead of an AMT, why not just fix taxable corporate income so it includes the financial data that are excluded from taxable income? I don't know if you can see that, Kim, or not. but Yeah, I, uh, I'm not looking at the questions. I was counting on you to monitor that, but I right. think that is a really good question. And it's really one of political economy to answer that. I mean, I think almost any sensible person... Uh, would think, well, we gave Congress the right to tax. If Congress isn't happy with the amount of tax that they're collecting, given the current law, they should change the current law uh, in appropriate fashion to, to claw back the things that they wish they hadn't given away. However, I think we sometimes get into the situation where we've given people preferences for X and Y and Z, and we've made the tax code favorable for A and B and C. Um, and we want nonetheless for companies to pay some tax. So rather than saying, okay, well, X, Y, Z, A, B, and C aren't as desirable as we think they are, we instead, you know, find the minimum tax more attractive because you can basically say, okay, if you manage to do so much of these activities that you get below some threshold, then, then maybe you should pay some tax, right? Although, as I mentioned, this, this tax was designed to preserve many of those things, not all of them, uh, but many of those things, right? So I think what will trigger it will, will tend to be other miscellaneous book tax things. Um, and I don't think um, Congress pr probably had the appetite to go through those lines of the M3 and be like, okay, well, let's change the tax treatment of this, that, and the other thing. I think they just thought, well, if it's too... If, if it's too advantageous, then you should have to pay some sort of minimum tax. It was just easier in a way. Yeah, from my perspective, I think that's a you know reason for disagreeing with the creation of this tax uh, in principle. Um, that if you know Congress believes that it's unwarranted for a company to have you know, or for, uh, said another way, companies have paid little or no taxes for reasons that Congress intended. They wanted to subsidize certain uh, activities or. Um, it would be unfair for businesses to not use their losses. Um, so I think those are very uh, normal and legitimate reasons for, um, you know, for taxpayers paying little or, or no um, taxes. And it's only for a period of time. So I think I disagree in principle with the need for a book tax in Congress if it feels like uh, clawing back basic provisions of the code, it should do so explicitly rather than create some uh, minimum tax that um, you know, claws back those in, in some backdoor way. Uh, and businesses don't know when they're actually going to be facing that tax uh, or not. Um, let me follow uh, up another question. This was one that Howard asked uh, Lily, and maybe Don, you may have a different view. Uh, what are the concerns about using income reported on financial statements, even if it's a modified version, uh, as a base for the corporate minimum tax? Or does it trouble you using financial income as a tax base? Yeah, I, it does. And I, I think for the, the questions um, that Howard uh, raised, and you know, how will that not erode uh, the quality of financial reporting? I think there will be incentives to uh, lower your income or to lobby FASB for uh, changes to the law that are favorable. So it, it can erode uh, the quality of, of financial reporting. And I there is a fundamental reason why we have book income versus tax or, uh, taxable income. Those are two entirely you know, separate accounting measures. Um, you know, one is um, 
you know, measuring your tax liability, we want to encourage certain activities. So I, I don't think we want to commingle the two or see them be uh, the same in the end. Okay. Do, any, any comments, Kim? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I guess I would say that, you know, I think if we wanted to make a case for this, we would say, okay, it appears that companies have an incentive to lower their taxable income and they have an incentive to exaggerate their accounting income in order to please their, uh, you know, financial investors. And so by having elements of uh, book income in the tax base, you can basically mute both of those incentives. Like we don't want people being too aggressive in either one of those dimensions. And I think that's the argument, you know, that that Lily made. You know, I, I do think most experts, you know, in this area would probably find other corporate tax increases more attractive than this particular one. You know, I don't think you're going to find a lot of tax policy experts who are like, this was the ideal one, <laughs> you know, relative to the other ones that we could have chosen. I think what and it ended up being is that it was sort of the last tax standing in part because it was very politically popular. And if you have to ask, well, why is this one politically popular? I think it really comes down to the fact that people just don't like the idea of really large companies telling their shareholders one thing, right? Like we're making more than a billion dollars and then telling the IRS another, right? Like there's something that doesn't quite sit right for people. And I think that's why this one ended up being, you know, viscerally attractive, even though the experts might find, uh, and I'm sure that both Don and I could design a, a similar amount of revenue raising corporate tax increases in a way that, I think experts would find more attractive, but this was this was the one that you know Congress managed to get done. Okay, I'm going to direct this one to you, Kim, and it's something people have talked obviously a lot about um, tax avoidance by companies by shifting um, profits overseas to low tax jurisdictions, and of course you have the OEC effort to constrain that, and you have Pillar Two. Um, some people confuse the minimum tax to to pillar two, it's obviously not that minimum tax, but what kind of overlap might there be, if any, and, and how do those things sort of fit together? There is some overlap, um, and you can tell, for instance, because you're going to get a different revenue score for this tax based on whether it's stacked before or after, you know, the hypothetical uh, international provisions, right? And so I think this tax does pick up some incremental revenue from companies that um, have been shifting a lot of profit offshore. You know, the guilty tax base also does that. Um, it's sort of tops out at a somewhat lower rate than this one. So there's a, you know, kind of a sliver of rate difference between this one and the other one. There's also a slightly different base um, between this and the guilty, right? So it's not the same at all. Um, and it's certainly not the same as the international tax reforms that have been proposed. Not only does the base differ in some key ways, but it's also administered on a global averaging basis rather than a country by country basis. And the country by country version would be far more effective in reducing uh, tax competition pressures and profit shifting pressures because effectively it would end the reason for any haven would have to have a rate below 15% because, you know, some other country would then top up the tax to 15% if they were below that, if you do that on a country by country basis. Whereas this minimum tax is, is averaged. And so there's still a strong incentive for Bermuda or some other jurisdiction to have this zero rate because a company can earn income in Germany or Japan or some other higher tax country, average it with the Bermuda income and still end up not owing uh, minimum tax. And so there's there's not an incentive for the, the hyper low tax rate jurisdictions to go away under this regime, although there would be in the international reforms. So the, so the basis has a little bit of overlap, but it's really trying to do a different thing than the, than the international reforms. Do you have any comment, um, Don, on that? Any... No, yeah, I, th I think they serve completely different purposes. And, um, you know, I've heard the argument made in some cases that, it, you know, the best thing you could say about the minimum tax is that it's in effect a revenue down payment that you could flip into some other revenue neutral reform uh, like these international changes. But if that's the best thing you can say about it, it's probably not very good. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that's one of my hopes for it, <laughs> even if... You know, if you're getting uh, 
200 billion plus from, you know, a set of companies that you might be able to say, you know, that's not necessarily the tax policy you want, but this other one, right, would align with the rest of the countries in the world if they move forward, right, would achieve these other objectives of, of more tax certainty, less probability of, of double taxation or double non-taxation or U.S. companies having to pay maybe three different minimum taxes, right, because if the rest of the world adopts this international regime and we have this CAMT as well as guilty, right? You could imagine a US company could end up with three different minimum tax regimes. So, you know, in, in the ideal world, we, you know, consider swapping this out. And kind of related to that, this is kind of a complicated, I'll direct this to you, Don, but you can answer too, Kim. Um, the question that one always answers when you have a complex proposal is what are companies going to do to get around it? What what kind of behavioral responses um, do you see are likely that might subvert the intent of the tax or otherwise reinforce it? You know, whatever. I'm not trying to prejudge I, that. I don't know how easy it, it necessarily is to to plan around. I mean, maybe the most action would be in how uh, financial income is uh, reported, but I think it's it's relatively straightforward. Otherwise, you're paying a tax based off of uh, your your book income. And then you're paying the difference between that and whatever, whatever is your existing corporate tax. So I don't know how easy it is to avoid. Um, there are some interesting technical questions on this subject, but I think I'm just going to move on and maybe come back because we have a lot of, of other things you guys would like to talk about, I'm, I'm sure. Um, let's just say, let's just talk a little bit about the stock uh, buyback tax. I, I think the current tax law does favor stock buybacks over dividends uh or does it and or should it and what what are the economic effects of favoring stock buybacks what what does that do i think one of the interesting things about this tax i mean it's very novel tax it's not something that we've tried before mm -hmm. and i think it sort of responds to discontent in the wake of both frankly the 2004 american jobs creation act if you go back that far or also the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of, of 2017. When you look in the wake of the those pieces of legislation, which did deliver, you know, hopeful incentives that companies would respond to these tax cuts and these changes in regimes with more investment and more job creation, we often saw instead this big surge in buybacks. And I think that frustrated a lot of um, Congress people who are like, hey, I thought you needed this money to invest in factories and employment, and instead you're returning it to your shareholders. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it doesn't get into the U.S. capital markets through the shareholders, right? They now have cash that they can invest in other firms that can then do investments. But if you look at the current law tax code, right, if you issue a dividend and return the money to the shareholders that way, it's taxable, right? Whereas if you uh, retain earnings within the firm and then buy back some of your shares, then some shareholders can decide to sell. Other shareholders can just see their stock price rise. And that's a more tax favored way to get the money back to the um, buyers. So when you look at this very small tax, it's a 1% tax, it reduces somewhat this distortion in the tax code against dividends and in favor of um, capital gains. And so I think when economists and legal experts have analyzed this, this tax, they think at low levels, it could actually be one of the instances of what, introducing a distortion, actually reducing the overall distortion in the tax system, because there's already an existing distortion and you're reducing the, the disadvantage of, of dividends relative to um, share repurchases. And how would you see that, uh, Don? Yeah, I don't think it's going to have a big effect, to just given how um, small the tax is on capital allocation. I know research from tax policy centers found it would lead to you know one and a half percent increase in dividends. Um, I think the argument here is that yeah, if the full amount of dividends are taxed, but only the appre appreciation and the share price is taxed under cap gains. So they're paying the same tax rate, but it's a different amount of, of the total value of it. I would just say that I, you know I don't think that there's um, a lot of um, merit here, and I, I, I guess I disagree on on the kind of record. Of, you know, TCJA, yes, you know, when you, you uh, say if you lower corporate taxes, it will reduce taxes paid on prior profits as well as new profits. So yes, um, prior profits, they can, they do get, it is a windfall benefit on that. And that results, it's an average tax rate reduction. And then 
you can use some of that extra cash to buy back um, shares. But but it does re- reduce marginal rates as well, and some of that will spur new activity. And I think you know the record of TCBA is pretty um, clear in seeing that investment uh, beat forecast. And I think uh, the you know, full expensing and lower corporate rate did help with that. Um, but you know when it comes to you know buybacks, I think um, you know I, I don't think there is a need. Um, to, to change the tax treatment of it. I think the best thing you could say in this case is levying a tax on um, buybacks in, in, in response to what Kim was saying about the distortion is uh, maybe the firm retains and, and now pursue the lower return investment as a result of this. You know, the reason a company would buy back stock is they don't have um, something to invest in that's profitable. But now if they're going to face additional tax liability for repurchasing the share, maybe at the margin, they'll say, um, for a certain low return investment that it's, okay, well, it's going to yield the same you know, tax effect or is, that it has the same impact on my bottom line. Any response, Kim? Or? Well, I think, you know, it, it's pretty clear that the literature on the wake of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you know, the vast majority of it doesn't show a big surge in investment in the wake of that um, outside of a couple sectors that probably had unrelated surge in investment. I know some of your colleagues at Tax Policy Center have have done papers on this. Uh, I think Bill Gale has one, um, but there, there are others in the academic literature as well. So I'm not sure that we really see that big investment. We did see a run up in the stock market in the anticipation of that legislation and, and you also saw a, you know record buybacks you know so i think that experience is part of what made this tax instrument seem somewhat attractive like i don't think it is going to be i i agree with don that i don't think this is going to be a game changer in the sense of now with this 1% tax companies are going to be doing entirely different things i think it is however a way for the government to say if you are just going to simply cycle back this money to your shareholders, at least give us 1% of it, you know, so it is raising, you know, a serious amount of money, not, not nothing um, that you can use for some of these other fiscal priorities, like the clean energy tax credits. Now, presumably the buybacks had big surge had something to do with the international the elimination of the, uh, the tax on repa- repatriation, right? Because yeah. you had no incentive to hold the money overseas anymore. Yeah, and I, we won't re- relook at TCJ, but I would say if you're looking at economic forecasts, it's important not just look at a time series, but relative to a counterfactual and investment is certainly better than any pre-reform counterfactual. Um, so you guys are not macroeconomists, but uh, so I'm not going to ask you for a forecast. Maybe you are, but I'm not going to ask you for an economic forecast. But clearly we're in a turbulent environment and we have a lot of inflation going on. Uh, but the efforts of the Fed to constrain inflation could throw the economy into recession. So how should these considerations affect corporate tax policy? Um, you know, either, either if inflation persists or the economy soft, softens. I'll, I'll let you start, Don, and I'll turn to Kim. Yeah, I think the first goal is um, do no harm. Um, so I, I think you wouldn't want to pursue um, policies that are ex- explicitly reduce average tax rates and have little effect on marginal rates that if you're doing that it's going to be more demand side and stimulative in the short term um, so you know I think that uh, maybe if we enter a recession or something like that you should be focused on um, you know uh, supply side incentives for businesses um, and, and probably not too much um, beyond that depending on the nature of the recession and I know we may kind of get into this going forward but I, I think um, you know, legislators should continue. I think what will start in TCJ and moving the tax system more towards a uh, consumption based and a, and a de- destination based system. So, you know, when it comes to, uh, say, R&D amortization, which is, is already kicked in, I don't know about how I don't feel that a retroactive tax policy is a good thing, but I think that we should ensure uh, have permanence there and uh, repeal amortization. And I think we should uh, make full expensing uh, permanent, but we, I think you know the interest limitation can can ratchet up because I think full denial there is consistent with the cash flow tax base. Yeah, so I guess I would add two things to that. Uh, one is that we do have very high and troubling inflation at present, and so I think that makes 
the case even stronger than it already was, and it was already quite strong for fully funding any um, tax cut or any um, you know budgetary expense, right? I, I don't think we should be adding to the deficit in a, in a high inflation environment. And so if we do want to do something like be more generous to r and &E, you know, and I'm sympathetic to the idea of moving toward expensing rather than amortization, I think you have to look for other sources of revenue to pay for that, uh, to make sure that you're not adding even more aggregate demand and even more deficit finance in a time when we have high deficits, high debt, and high inflation. I also think when thinking about tax instruments, the other uh, element of your question, Eric, was the uncertainty. Do we have an, inf a, you know, a recession coming? Do we have inflation? Like, what is our macro problem? And this is a really vexing macroeconomic time because there's some probability of recession at the same time that we're facing this inflation. And so you really want to focus on tax instruments that can handle both parts of the business cycle that are naturally countercyclical. And luckily we have several tax instruments that are naturally countercyclical, but those are the ones we should be thinking about. And, and one that leaps to mind that is really the subject of this exact conversation is the corporate tax. I mean, if you think about corporate tax is only paid by profitable companies, as soon as a company stops making profits, they stop paying the tax. And in fact, if they generate losses, those losses can also be used in future years to offset future tax burdens when the recovery might be, you know, uh, still nascent in, in the wake of a recession, right? So I do think this tax instrument is quite well suited to either environment, right? Because in an inflationary hot economy, when profits are rising, it will cause some of those profits to be shared with the state. But as soon as profits turn off, so does the tax, right? And so that that makes it a natural um, for either macro environment. So if you if you did want to arguably have rely more on the corporate tax in in a uncertain macro environment, what would be the thing to do to allow bonus to expire or to raise rates and keep bonus, extend bonus? Those are very different directions. Yeah, I think I would, all things equal, rather raise the revenue through a higher rate, um, because I think the argument for a higher rate is strongest when we think we're taxing profit, right? Not when we're taxing the normal return to capital. So if I had to choose between something that was relatively generous to an investment, but a higher rate, or a, a lower rate that wasn't generous to investment, I, I think the former is a, is a much better tax system because it's causing the corporate tax to mostly fall on these above normal returns to profit. And if you look at in recent years, there's research um, by three different groups, one at the IMF, one at Treasury, and, and one in academic, that suggests that the vast majority of the corporate base as it is under current law is falling on these above normal returns to profit. And I think the argument for taxing those um, and raising some revenue there is, is stronger than the the argument for taxing the normal return to capital. And, and it's quite strong, in fact, because it's more efficient than taxing uh, labor or the normal return to capital. And it's more equitable because those above normal returns to, to capital are often held in uh, disproportionately in the hands of those at the top of the income distribution. So you can raise revenue in, in a fair and efficient way. Well, we're, thank you. We're just about running out of time. Uh, I'd like to keep this going longer. This is interesting. Uh, but let me just say, uh, Don first and Kim last, if give you each of you a minute to summarize any anything else you would like to say about reforms of business taxation and where we should be headed. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you know, I think we should con we continue with where TCJ was was taking us, which was moving towards a more destination style based system of taxation. I think that solves the profit shifting problem that Kim has long written about. And I think Kim and I both agree that the, the tax burden should fall more heavily on supernormal returns. And I, the best way to do that is moving to a cash flow based system where you expense investment and I deductions for interest. And, you know, I think I still believe in a destination based cash flow tax. I would do that at a 15 percent rate. You could do that um, on a revenue neutral basis, basically lowering the rate and expensing would be paid for by interest in a border adjustment. I think it would solve all the problems that we're, uh, we're concerned with. Kim? I, I will agree that I would like to see more limits on interest, um, and I think that you could combine that with a more generous treatment of investment, and it would move the corporate tax base closer to 
uh, an above normal return uh, uh, tax base. But I think my number one priority would be uh, moving forward with this in international agreement. As, as attractive as the destination-based cash flow tax is at handling the profit shifting by focusing on the de destination basis, it's, um, you know, it isn't quite ready for prime time, whereas we do have now 135 plus countries who've agreed to a minimum level of, of corporate taxation, and that really reduces the competitiveness concerns associated with going it alone and raising corporate tax rates. If you've got a bunch of other countries that are ready to follow, should you lead, you know, I think that, that there's a strong argument for doing that. Now, of course, the United States probably not going to do that right away, but some of the other countries might. Um, you know, and I think we should be prepared to to follow them down that road because it makes it much easier to raise this corporate revenue in a fair and efficient way without being concerned about competitiveness because, you know, the other countries are also working on this. And and that agreement does come with an enforcement mechanism that that would be, you know, an important way to bring others along as well. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to resolve the international taxation issue in, in this half hour. I want to thank both of you for a stimulating session. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Thornton, my colleague Thornton Matheson, who's a senior fellow at the Tax Policy Center, and Thornton will moderate the uh, next session on uh, energy credits. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so let me uh, introduce our panel to discuss the green energy tax provisions of the IRA. Um, I am very excited to introduce our two energy tax experts, Xu Ting Pomerlo and Robertson Williams. Um, Xu Ting is research manager of climate policy at the Niskanen Center. She holds an MPP in climate policy from Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy, and she previously worked at the Cato Institute and the American Council on Renewable Energy. Robert N. Williams is a professor of agricultural and resource economics at the University of Maryland, a senior fellow with Resources for the Future, and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He also served as chief economist for the Climate Leadership Council from 2019 to 2021. Um, so, um, Lily gave us in her keynote um, a broad overview of many of the provisions of the uh, the the IRA, the the um, those relating to climate change. Uh, but let me just start off by asking um, Xu Ting, uh, what do you see as the most important energy tax provisions in the IRA? Those those that will have the biggest effect um, on the uh, on climate. Yeah, thank you, Thornton. There are a lot of climate provisions in the IRA. I will give you a quick uh, two-minute overview. There are more than two dozen of clean energy tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. The CBO estimated that these credits would cost about $260 billion over 10 years. There are two major groups of tax credits, tax credits for production, tax credits for consumers. On the production side, I would say the major tax credits are production tax credits, PTC, and investment tax credits, ITC. PTC are for electricity produced from qualified renewable energy sources. ITC are for investment in renewable energy projects. These two credits together would cost more than 150 billion over 10 years, and they're temporary. Another major credit on the production side is the Advanced Manufacturing Production Credit. Uh, they would cost about 30 billion over 10 years. They're also temporary. On the consumer side, the major tax credits are the residential clean energy tax credits that encourage the installation of residential solar, wind, and other types of renewable energy uh, technologies. And they would cost 22 billion over 10 years, and they're also temporary. Other than the specific provisions I just mentioned, there are also other smaller credits such as the clean vehicle tax credit um, and sustainable aviation fuel credit. I look forward to further discussions about these provisions. Thank you. Um, so uh, Rob, can you take us a little deeper then specifically into um, the PTC and the ITC? Um, the IRA contains numerous provisions that make these um, uh, to credits, which historically, not only have they been, you know, um, extended and expired several times, uh, but also they've been, uh, each has been limited to certain technologies. 
um, the IRA would make them uh, a lot more fungible uh, and uh, and and uh, loosen the technological restrictions. Could you talk about that a bit? And what is the significance of that for the energy sector and uh, and um, controlling greenhouse gas emissions? Sure. So uh, making them sort of closer to being refundable, having them be directly payable um, in at least some ca some cases. Um, so for the, the government or nonprofit utilities, um, and then saleable for the for-profits, uh, th that moves it closer to being sort of a clean subsidy run through the tax system, um, lowers your transaction costs, makes it more neutral across utilities, although not as much as if it were direct pay across the board. Um, right now, a lot of, uh, you know, the utilities don't have the tax liability to use the credits. And so they have to do sort of complicated workarounds like tax equity financing, uh, this this sort of makes the credits more liquid um, and and more valuable, uh, which which makes them more useful. Um, the technology neutrality, um, so that's that's clearly an improvement. The technology neutrality, I, I think, is generally an improvement. Um, I, I think it's worth noting what we really want is technological neutrality per uh, unit of greenhouse gas reductions. Um, that that's what we really care about. And what this is doing is making it technologically neutral per dollar of investment or per dollar of or per megawatt hour of production. And in different cases, you may have different amounts of greenhouse gas crowded out by a dollar of investment in different technologies um, or a, you know, a megawatt hour of production from different technologies. So it's not quite it's not quite what we want. What we really want is technologically neutral across the the, the greenhouse gas reduction. This is particularly an issue because we're making it technologically neutral, or the IRA makes it technologically neutral between generation technologies and storage technologies, um, things like batteries and hydrogen that are really storing energy, not not generating it. Um, and it's less obvious that that's you know, something that's going to be greenhouse gas neutral per dollar when you're, when you're making that kind of comparison. I still think on net, it's probably a positive. Um, and, uh, but, but it's not the slam dunk that you might think. And technological neutrality is generally good, but technological neutrality relative to what? Um, so not clear how much of a difference all of this will make. Um, so I think it's generally going to make the, the credits more effective than they had been before. Um, I actually think the, the, the longer lasting, you know, not having to worry about whether it'll get renewed right away, the fact that these are extended for a, a substantial period of time is going to make more of a difference. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's not obvious ex ante, and it'll be interesting to see research as we go through. May I, may I add a quick point? Please. Yes, um, I agree with what uh, Rob just said. And I also want to make, make a comment. I think making the ITC and PTC policies refundable and saleable is, is a good policy. Um, this is similar to what lawmakers did in 1981. The safe harbor leasing provision allow companies to sell their depreciation deductions and investment tax credits to other companies for cash. And the goal of the provision at that time was really to stimulate economic growth and provide investment incentives to companies that made little or no profits. Now, making the clean energy credits in RA saleable would uh, match the benefit with the timing of the economic activity. If uh, you make the manufacturers um, to use the credits in the future, if the credits are carried forward, uh, they might not be able to fully utilize the benefits. Great, thank you. Um, so, Xu Tang, um, so we've talked about how the IRA liberalizes the clean energy tax credits, um, but it also introduces some important new restrictions, such as labor and domestic content requirements. How administrable are those provisions? There's been a lot of um, you know talk about that, um, but also how will they impact credit effectiveness? Yes, I think uh, these restrictions, uh, in my perspective, there are more of a political consideration rather than a policy consideration. Um, the labor standards are probably easier to uh, implement uh, compared to the domestic content requirements. Uh, for example, say like if you look at a piece of solar panel with the global complex supply chain is really hard to 
uh, sorted out which part comes from which country and where is it assembled, where the raw materials are coming from. Um, my concern is uh, these restrictions would make uh, these clean energy credits less effective. And if the goal is to incentivize emissions reductions as soon as possible, um, they might not uh, make the credits as effective as policies, uh, policymakers envision them to be. Mm -hmm. um, Rob, any uh, thoughts? Yeah, on that? I guess a couple of things. I mean, even if it doesn't really limit use of these credits, it still drives up costs. And that, you know, I, I worry not just about environmental effectiveness, but also cost effectiveness of the policy. And this seems to be clearly bad for that. Um, sort of harmful to US consumers, to uh, stuff like that. Um, so um, I also, I, I, you know, you, you hear the, the argument that this is gonna uh, sort of boost supply chain robustness to sort of be directing more domestic production. It's not at all obvious to me that that's the case, that I, I feel like this is sort of encouraging putting all your eggs in one basket, um, which is the opposite of robustness. And I worry about some of the larger implications that, you know, this isn't WTO compatible, more generally, it's a step back, at least the domestic uh, assembly re requirement, more broadly, a step back on trade issues. Um, and, you know, free trade has been really good for the US and for the world, not for every person, uh, but, you know, for, and, or even for every community, um, but for the country as a whole. Um, and, and I worry about sort of taking a step back from that. I worry about some of our allies are pretty upset about the, um, the domestic assembly requirements discriminating against their auto industry. There's a lot of sort of non-environmental consequences that, that strike me as worrisome with this. You mentioned, um, you know, the effect on uh, uh, the impact on specific communities um, and the IRA offers higher green credit levels um, for many credits um, for project in so-called energy communities, which are either um, uh, energy communities uh, where a lot of people are involved in extractive industries, coal and oil, um, or they could also be highly dependent on um, fossil fuel and uh, energy from fossil fuels um, and also low income communities. So is this an effective way to both promote clean energy and or support, support those communities? So uh, there's a clear, you know, a, a, a laudable goal here, which is, to, you know, we're going to have big effects on if this is successful in moving us away from fossil fuels, that's going to have substantial effects on the communities that produce those fuels, process those fuels, and so forth. Um, the, you know, we want to take care of low income people. We want to take care of people who are going to be hurt by this. Um, at the same time, these provisions are going to be inefficient from an environmental standpoint. You could get a bigger reduction in emissions at the same total cost if you didn't vary the credit in this way, if you made it sort of neutral across locations. Um, I, I also sort of you know, take issue with the idea that we should be supporting communities, that you know, what I care about is supporting people, not supporting communities. And that can be different, that if people move, um, then supporting a community may be different from supporting the people. Um, so um, now in some cases, you know, supporting community might be a good way to support people. Um, that so one of my grad students uh, is, has um, a new paper that finds substantial effects of the drop in coal demand on local government revenue in coal communities. And, um, you know, not huge effects, but significant effects. Um, so Dan Cranach, who, by the way, is on the job market this year, in case anyone is uh, looking to hire. Uh, the uh, Dan's paper finds these sort of significant, not huge, but significant effects. And presumably those are affecting local government services. Um, and there you can really see some argument for trying to help the community. But even in those cases, I'd be more inclined to provide grants to local governments or help, you know, try and help provide local services in those communities or to support individuals in ways that might spill back into the community. Um, having a bigger subsidy for energy projects is, is, is poorly targeted. Um, you know, that said, maybe this is what was politically feasible and they could get it in there and something that would be better targeted might not be. Uh, well, sort of, uh, to take that in a different direction, um, 
Uh, Lily commented that, you know, overall, the uh, green energy provisions should be lowering uh, household um, business costs. I believe the Rhodium Group uh, has estimated um, lowering that energy costs would go down by as much as 12 percent. And one of our audience members um, then asked a question about the incidence of these various uh, green tax credits. And, and, and of course, there are a wide variety of them. But um, in general, um, you know, would you expect uh, the more of the incidents to fall uh, a good pass through of the, the benefits of these um, various tax credits for consumers um, or um, more on the business side? I think you're going to uh, see a mix that there's going to be some pass through to consumers. Um, there's going to be some um, going to the, the you know, profits of businesses, um, some to workers. Um, it, Congress clearly was concerned about workers with some of the, you know, the domestic content provisions and the labor standards and stuff like that. They, they are, the, you know, those things are designed to have distributional effects, um, sort of send some of the benefits to, uh, to particular industries, particular workers, particular, you know, manufacturers, et cetera. Um, the mix, I think it's gonna be very, very difficult to predict. And, and studies in this area are, I mean, so if you look at the, the previous set of electric vehicle tax credits, um, you would have expected given the structure of those that, that they would be absorbed almost entirely by the manufacturers. Um, and Jim Salee, who's now at Berkeley, uh, had a very nice paper that showed, no, in fact, a lot of them got passed through to consumers, even though standard economic theory wouldn't have predicted that. And it's, it's a little bit of a puzzle. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure we entirely know, but but you know, I'm sure it's going to be some mix. Uh, Xu Ting, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with uh, what Rob said. I, I think that we don't really know. Um, I mean, that's the downside of using tax credits. And some companies may capture the, the benefits of these credits. And compared to a carbon tax, which I'm sure we'll uh, mention uh, and discuss in a bit, that um, the effects of a carbon tax are uh, much easier to estimate compared to regulations and, and tax credits. Well, apropos then of, of carbon pricing, um, we've seen that many developed countries um, and some U.S. states even uh, rely heavily on carbon pricing, which can either be a carbon tax um, or some, some type of cap and trade mechanism. Um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. federal government approach, however, has relied heavily on tax subsidies, such as these green tax credits that we're discussing, uh, and also regulation. Um, what are the pros and cons of this approach versus relying on carbon pricing? Shuteng. Yeah, um, so I'll talk about the pros first of tax uh, subsidies and regulation. Uh, first of all, I think it's, they're easier to do politically. That's why they were passed in the IRA. Um, second, I think uh, these tax credits, they are trying to uh, make energy cheaper compared to fossil fuels. So they're trying to change the rel relative prices between clean energy and fossil fuels. Um, there are several cons of uh, such policy. First of all, uh, these clean energy credits, they're not directly pricing carbon emissions. So they would not uh, discourage fossil fuel consumption. In fact, um, because you're subsidizing clean energy sources, you might actually increase the overall consumption of, of energy. Um, with tax subsidies and regulations, um, I think one big feature of these policies is you, you will really have to do them sector by sector. Um, policymakers will have to spend a lot of time use a lot of uh, resources to figure out what would be reasonable performance standards or technology standards for a specific sector. You can't really just um, make a clear cut for all the sectors. Um, also, they're not as economically efficient as um, alternative policies, say, for example, a fiscal tool, a carbon tax, uh, to incentivize emissions reduction. Um, I would also point out that uh, regulations uh, would be really um, vulnerable to legal and administrative challenges. I think a really good example is the Clean Power Plan um, put in place um, by the EPA under the Obama administration. It took 
a long time for it to um, be finalized, but then um, it was stayed by the Supreme Court um, after a year. So um, if, if the goal is to really incentivize emissions reductions really quickly and across the board, um, I, I worry that regulations are not really uh, the, the effective ways to go. Um, I would also um, add that regulation, they tend to treat all pollution sources the same um, versus say a carbon tax, they will allow companies to reduce emissions efficiently according to their own technical and uh, economic characteristics. Um, Rob, anything to add Just, on that? Um, yeah, I guess a couple points. Um, one, I, I disagree with one of the things Xu Ting listed as a pro. Um, that uh, I, I don't think low energy prices are an end in and of themselves, um, that they're, they're good in terms of being good for economic activity, welfare of households, stuff like that. Um, but there are other ways to, to, to handle that, um, you know, various transfers using carbon tax revenue and stuff like that. So even that one, I'm not sure is a pro. Um, and, and worth citing sort of a, you know, a, a quick number on sort of what the effectiveness difference is here, resulting from all of the things that Xu Teng was talking about. Um, you know, the, the projections that the administration has been, has been promoting suggest that this is going to get us to about 40% reduction below 2005 levels by 2030, or, or about 10% more than we would be doing uh, without any policy. Um, estimates are that you could match that with a carbon tax somewhere between 10 and $15 a ton, which is a lot lower than most proposals um, and, you know, would not have, you know, I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing that might affect gas prices by 10 or 15 cents a gallon. That's a pretty small, um, pretty small kind of policy uh, to match the effectiveness here. Um, uh, but this is, it's kind of like Kim's comment earlier about the book minimum tax that you know like no economist who's looked at this problem would design uh climate policy like this if they didn't have political constraints but you have to get it passed um and this passed and not clear that anything else could have um so um so like shooting said the, the political feasibility i mean that's 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 the reason it was done this way right well, so while most of the IRA provisions concern tax credits, um, there is one exception uh, uh, which takes a carbon pricing approach, and that is the um, $90 to $1,500 per ton charge on methane emissions uh, affecting uh, emissions above a threshold on petroleum production and transmission facilities. Um, what's the significance of this fee, and, and what will be its impact on U.S. greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, uh, so the the methane fee is really the first time the federal government has directly put a, a charge, a fee or tax, whatever you call it, on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, according to the CBO, um, this would raise about $6 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, in terms of the impact of, of the methane fee in the IRA, I think uh, it's too early to tell at this stage. Uh, because of several factors, uh, depending on the the current currently pending EPA regulations, um, I think in November last year they proposed um, doing a, a regulation on methane emissions from the same categories of facilities subjected uh, under the methane fee in the IRA. So, um, depending on how the regulation would would come out. Uh, they might provide exemptions from the, the methane fee in the IRA. So that's the first factor. Uh, this is the second factor, I would say, um, this methane fee, it does not apply to all industrial facilities. It only applies to a subset of uh, industrial facilities that fall underneath the greenhouse gas uh, reporting framework program. Um, so the, the scale is relatively small. And also if you look at uh, methane emissions as a per percentage of the total US total greenhouse gas emissions, it only accounts for about 11% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And of course the big elephant in the room is we have a lot of uh, carbon dioxide emissions we need to address. Um, despite all of that, I think um, this fee is right step forward in the right direction, even though it's a relatively small fee, um, I, I would really want to um, 
see a carbon tax going forward, like directly pricing carbon emissions? Let, let me add, without a price on carbon and without anything that's really trying to push us away from coal and towards natural gas, which is much more carbon efficient per unit of energy, um, this could actually increase carbon uh, emissions uh, or could actually increase greenhouse gas emissions. That to the extent that it dis discourages oil and gas production, particularly gas, a big chunk of the, I mean, the, we've had huge reductions in emissions over the last decade plus as a result of a shift from coal to gas, as a result of the fracking revolution. If this discourages gas production, you might actually slow or reverse that kind of shift and push us back toward coal. That could be a net negative. Um, with carbon pricing, you wouldn't have to worry about that. But when you don't have a carbon price and you're doing a methane price, um, now a lot of it depends on exactly how companies respond, very much details of implementation of this and, and the, the regulation that, that Shooting mentioned. Um, but there is the, the potential that this is actually actually negative. Now, combine it with a carbon tax, it's a clear, unambiguous positive, and, and it's a step toward pricing emissions, which is a good thing. Uh, but by itself, uh, there's some worries. All right. Uh, roughly, um, uh, what what level of carbon tax is the methane fee uh, uh, correspond to? Because methane, of course, has a much higher uh, immediate impact on the climate, although it doesn't last as long in the atmosphere as as CO2. I think uh, the $900 per metric ton of methane increased to about $1,500 proposed in IRA equates to about $36 to uh, $60 per metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. So I would say it's comparable to uh, the carbon tax rate proposed in the uh recent legislation that were introduced on the hill in the last yeah, though, couple of years though that's using a 20-year global warming potential comparison which is is highly controversial so i don't think we have time to get into why but but it's it's an issue worth mentioning uh yeah and no, we don't don't want to get too technical either um uh or we 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 might lose a significant chunk of our audience um uh, one, uh, uh, we've talked about sort of the, the, the federal government's aversion, uh, generally speaking, to carbon pricing, but one proposal that's out there um, that, that may still be revived in uh, the coming session is the proposal for having a border carbon adjustment, um, which typically accompanies a carbon tax, um, and uh, a carbon tax can be a source-based uh, policy on, on a fossil fuel production, um, uh, but a car border carbon adjustment by alleviating any uh, carbon tax on exports and subjecting uh, carbon imports of at least carbon intensive goods from countries without a significant uh, carbon tax makes it, makes it a consumption or destination based tax. So uh, many countries such as the EU and Canada that are introducing significant uh, carbon prices will also have carbon border adjustments, but the US has a proposal um, to impose um, a carbon uh, to do a, a border carbon adjustment without having a, um, a uniform domestic carbon price. Um, does does this make po this policy make sense? Um, and or you know or what's uh, what are the pros and cons of that approach? Um, no, <laughs> the. Uh... The, uh, I mean, it, it, to, to elaborate on that a little, you know, border adjustment with a domestic carbon price makes a lot of sense that you don't want production shifting to avoid a carbon tax in one country shifting somewhere else. That distorts international trade. Um, it can increase world emissions um, because the emissions just move somewhere else that may actually be less carbon efficient than, than where they're starting from. Um, but if you, so, so there are a lot of arguments for doing it with a, a domestic carbon price, but taxing imported carbon when you're not uh, taxing domestic emissions of carbon uh, doesn't make any sense. That it, it's just it's just protectionism, anti-free trade. Um, it it distorts international trade, and it has all the disadvantages that I was talking about earlier about 
policies moving against free trade. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I think, I think it's not, not a great approach. So. Xu Ting, anything to add? I know this is something you've written about. Yeah, I've written a lot about this subject and the messaging that I keep uh, putting out there is, I agree totally with what Rob just said. It does not make any sense to have a border carbon adjustment without any domestic carbon pricing policies. I think oftentimes a border adjustment is confused with carbon tariffs and oftentimes border adjustments are discussed as a standalone policy as if you could just um, do it on its own, but it doesn't really make sense if you don't have a domestic carbon tax. I'm not sure what you're adjusting at the border. Um, a border adjusted carbon tax, the goal is to really equalize the tax burden between domestically produced and imported goods. It's really not giving any undue advantage or competitiveness advantage to domestic uh, manufacturers. I think oftentimes border adjustment is confused with carbon tariffs and it is framed as a competitive uh, policy that's punish more carbon intensive foreign producers. But I think let's come back to the point of um, a really good tax policy, a border adjusted tax policy is you really want to um, equalize the tax burden between domestic and foreign producers and you're not really giving advantage to either side. So short answer is no, it does not make sense. And I hope they don't <laughs> pass it as law. Well, as, as both uh, Lily and, and Rob have mentioned, um, the government estimates that the IRA will reduce U.S. carbon emissions to about 40 percent of their 2005 levels. Um, and it, uh, without the IRA, uh, we would still have gotten to about 30 percent. So this gives us an extra 10 percentage points toward our Paris commitment of reducing uh, carbon emissions um, to um, at most 50% of their 2005 levels. Um, although, you know, um, there are studies by the uh, IMF and other organizations showing that even if everybody met their Paris goals, we would still have to go further to uh, to stabilize the, um, uh, the climate. Um, nonetheless, um, so this gets us half of the remaining distance. Um, how do we do the other half, Rob? Well, um, well, first, I just want to say I'm a little skeptical of the 40%, um, that I think it's it's a little optimistic about how much you'll lose as a result of the various restrictions we've, we've talked about, domestic content, labor rules, et cetera, how much new transmission you're going to get built, stuff like that. Um, but getting you know setting that aside, um, you know, the best approach subject to feasibility uh, would be doing a carbon tax that you'd fit, fill in the gaps in what the IRA does, get substantially more reductions, even with a relatively small tax. Um, you know, you'd be sort of picking up all the low cost stuff that the IRA misses. Um, if that's not feasible, something like, a, you know, well-designed clean energy standard um, could uh, could sort of move you know move the needle significantly even on top of the the IRA um, uh, there was something like that in the original Build Back Better bill the SEP um, but it had some serious issues no partial credit for gas problems with gaming the credit etc um, and it didn't pass um, so it's not clear that a, a CES particularly one that might be better designed it's not clear that would be politically feasible either um, easier permitting for energy transmission, um, especially electricity. Um, that, you know, that's something that uh, you, you're probably going to need that even to get to the 40 percent. Um, but it might, if you can go far enough on it, it might help you push past the 40 percent. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think without sort of something like a carbon price, it's going to be hard to get to the, the 50 percent target. Um, and, and I'm worried that we're going to do sort of a whole bunch of very inefficient regulations through executive action, um, because that's sort of the only thing that you can do without without getting it through Congress. Um, but that's a lot more costly, and I'm, I'm skeptical it's going to get you to 50 percent. We're really out of time, but Xu Ting, I wanted to give you uh, an opportunity if, if there's anything you want to add on uh, on that. 
Yeah, I am a strong advocate of the carbon tax. I think it's the best climate policy that will incentivize emissions reduction quickly and widely across the economy. I think um, there may be a political window to uh, pass a carbon tax when there is a strong need to raise a lot of revenue and you could use the revenue to rebate to households or uh, invest more in clean energy technologies. And uh, the distributional impact of the carbon tax is clearly studied. And there are a lot of ways to uh, really mitigate the potential negative impact of the carbon tax on, on the economy. Um, so right. carbon tax. To, no, to mention the, way the fact that, that energy costs will be going down as a result of the, of the IRA. So um, that might be viewed as creating some space for a carbon tax without raising net energy costs. Well, I want to thank all the panelists um, and all our audience members uh, for joining us for uh, today's event. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>